lone figure of a man, an empty stadium, a dramatic setting. That man walking across the football field below is one of the most distinguished actors in Hollywood. If you were closer, you'd recognize him as one of your favorites, and he has been for the last quarter of a century. Well, this letter that I have from Mr. B.F. Marnoka of Washington, D.C., reveals his name. During my college years on the campus of the University of Notre Dame, a motion picture titled Canute Rockney was filmed there. It was my privilege to view a number of the scenes being taken, starring Pat O'Brien as Canute Rockney. Would it be possible to bring him on your show and ask him to give us the intimate story of Rockney of Notre Dame and to depict this greatest of all coaches once more giving one of his famous staccato voice locker room speeches? Well, this letter was the first of hundreds of requests asking for the appearance of this great star. Yes, waiting on the gridiron below is the best man we can think of to tell the story of Canute Rockney, Pat O'Brien. Canute Rockney, the rock. He was the soul and the mind, the heart and the brain of modern high-geared football. He molded gridiron teams so great they became a myth, and rock became a legend. Time has not dulled the magic or the memory of football's greatest coach. Yes, here, right here on this field, this Los Angeles Coliseum turf, the last Rockney team closed the season of 1930. A few months later, March the 31st, 1931, Rock was dead, struck down at the peak of his career in a plane crash. But before we get to the end, let's go back to the beginning. At the age of 22, far beyond the years of most freshmen, he went to Notre Dame, which at that time had only 700 students. Rockley only came to Notre Dame because John Plant, a friend of his on the track team, assured him he could live cheaply there. His first day on campus, he just walked about with his battered old suitcase. Still undecided, he spent the night in town. Next morning, he enrolled. After a severe examination, he was assigned to the subway in Soren Hall. So named because they were basement rooms. He earned every hour of his education, sweeping floors, waiting on tables. In 1914, Rock graduated with a 92.5% scholastic average, more than enough to earn him a degree magna cum laude. On a shoestring, he married Bonnie Skiles on July 15th, 1914, culminating a two-year courtship. His future seemed to lie in the world of test tubes and Bunsen burners. He went to work in the chemistry lab as a teacher and a close assistant to Father Newland, a distinguished chemist. Now, this is Joe Mayen. Now, he remembers the rock not as a coach, but as a teacher in a classroom. I'll say I do. Knut Rockney was one of the loudest teachers any university or college had ever seen. I recall, as if it was yesterday, seeing him at the blackboard write no chemical formulas and quotations. He would then point to the class and shout him, have you got it? Have you got it? And what about you? Have you got it? Fine. My stockroom was on the third floor at the far end of the building. In spite of the distance, I always knew when Rockney was in the classroom because you could hear him. In 1918, Jess Harper retired to his ranch in Kansas, and Rockney retired from the chemistry laboratory to take over the football destiny of Notre Dame. Rock was just 30 when he took over. He built the schedules that made Notre Dame famous. Many gridiron greats were coached by the Rock. Most remembered as halfback George Gipp. The Gipper, they called him. In 1922, Rock had four All-Americans playing in the same backfield. Miller, Stolder, Crowley, and Layton. Grandlin Rice, dean of sports writers, immortalized them as the Four Horsemen. Yes, Rockney put Notre Dame and South Bend, Indiana on the map. 
he made the university a fortress of football power. But the people of South Bend did a lot for Rockton, too. Once, after the Irish had lost to Iowa, the coach feared a cool reception. But instead, more than 3,000 people thronged the station to welcome him and his losing team home. He was hoisted onto a baggage truck, and the crowd shouted, speech, speech. Rock gave him a short one. As long as you want me, I'll be here. Overconfidence on Rockney teams was always a threat. To one player, he said, that guy would just fall over if you'd show him your clippings. To another sluggish player, he said, there are some dumb people and some a little dumber, and you come next. And when a prima donna high school star couldn't take it, he stormed off Cartier Field with the remark, I'll never play for you again. Rockney crushed him with, you never have played for me. Rockney was thinking every minute. He got the idea for his backfield shift from a line of chorus girls. Can you rock me? had magnetism. It was composed of many things, as you find out when you talk to those who knew him best. That was The Rock's personal touch. He wasn't without inspiration. His wife, Bonnie, was always nearby. She felt that her place was in the home, which, during most of Rockney's coaching career, was this neat little house in South Bend. Tom Hickey was a neighbor and good friend of both Bonnie and Rock. You know, Rockney always enjoyed and enjoyed telling and repeating stories at his own expense. The Big Swede, as he was called so many times and referred to by himself, said one day there's nothing in the world dumber than a dumb Irishman except perhaps two smart Swedes. You know, I used to haunt the practice field out there. It was the greatest show on earth under Rockney. And uh, because of my enthusiasm and interest, Rockney issued to me the first pass I think he ever issued the secret practice. It's a little bit dog-eared and dilapidated. I've been carrying it for 32 years and because of the fact that I cherished it. You know, the Rockies were neighbors, good neighbors, warm neighbors, and their house was always haunted with the kids from Notre Dame, especially the football squad, and of course the focal point was not only Rock himself, but the refrigerator. It was always open house at Bonnie and Rock's. The Sage of South Bend, the Bald Eagle, the Rock. Yes, his teams were masterpieces. He chalked up 105 victories to 12 losses with only five ties. He was as well known as the president and as well loved as his friend, Will Rogers. His brand of football was winning football. Yes, win and win again. Once he did that, even at the risk of his life. Rock was stricken with a severe case of phlebitis and a blood clot condition developed in one of his legs. The year before, 1928, Notre Dame had gone through its poorest season since Rockney took over. Ugly rumors began circulating that the great Rockney was through, washed up. He was a sick man, but he had to make a comeback. As the season of 29 opened, his reputation was at stake, and he knew it. Rockney worked from a wheelchair or a stretcher. His face was contorted with pain most of the season. For him, they gave Notre Dame nothing but victories. Returning through Chicago as national champions, Rock's team of 1929 were received as if they had won a war. What was the Rockney magic? How was he so able to influence the minds and hearts of his great teams? Well, there are many answers. Probably the mystery of Rockney's magic was in his positive approach. He changed the, the die gamely to fight to live. Now, anyone who has heard any of his locker room speeches will never forget them. It went something like this. <laughs> All right, men. Everybody up. Everybody up. 
Now we're starting a new season today. We've got a tough schedule ahead of us. We're used to that in Notre Dame. Now let's get this straight from the start. I don't want any of you spoiled high school stars to think you're any better than anyone else. And that goes for you, let him in too. Any boy here who thinks that all he has to do is run past the ball or kick and make the team, turn your suit tonight. Turn it in tonight. You can't make the team here. Now, I'll expect you to maintain a high average in your studies. You didn't come to Notre Dame just to play football. Ten years from now, the public will have forgotten even the best of you. Football is a game for clean minds and clean bodies. I want every boy in the squad on the upbeat all the time. On the upbeat all the time. Remember this. The most important thing in football today is tackling and blocking. And blocking is the more important thing. When you hit a man, cut him down like a sack of wheat. Now, I'm going to tell you about somebody who most of you are too young to remember. I'll tell you about George Gipp, the first all American named at Notre Dame. Truly a will o' the wisp. I was with him when he died. He was going out. He looked up at me and he said, Rock, Rock, I'm not afraid. Honest, I'm not. But coach, someday when the going is tough and the boys aren't getting the breaks, tell them to go out and make just one for the Gipper. I don't know where I'll be then, coach, but I'll know about it. And I'll be happy. Oh, they want the backfield to hit that line. Right side. Right side. Left, left, right, right, left. I want you to go down that field, right down that field. They can't stop us. Nobody can stop us. I want you to go. Go, go. Hot on the March 31st, 1931, at the peak of his career, Rock was flying to Los Angeles. A farmer in the Flint Hills near Bazaar, Kansas, heard a plane's engine sputter. Die. Canute <laughs> Rockney was dead. Who was he? Here's what Father O'Donnell said of him. Who was he? Ask the president who dispatched a personal message. Ask the king of Norway who sends a delegation. Ask thousands of men and women from every walk of life. Ask the children and the boys of America. A hushed silence took command of the campus. The new stadium, his stadium, would never again hear Rockney's booming voice shout, Everybody up! His coach and friend, Jess Harper, went to Kansas and brought the Rock home. Thousands waited outside the Sacred Heart Church for Rock's final visit to Notre Dame. Rockney's team of 1930 carried his bronze casket from the church. Tears filled the eyes of those eight strong young men. Tears for the rock blinded our nation. One of his players said, I hope God takes care of Rockney as Rock took care of us. Will Rogers said, we are becoming so hardened by misfortune and bad luck that it takes a mighty big calamity to shock all this country. But Canute, you did it. We thought it would take a president's death to make a whole nation shake their heads in real sorrow and say, ain't it a shame he's gone? Well, that's what this country did today, Canute, for you. You died one of our national heroes. Notre Dame was your address, but every gridiron in America was your home.
Pat, we can truly say that your appearance here on You Asked For It Tonight is one of the show's highlights. Well, Jack, it's a great privilege to have answered a request by an alumnus from Notre Dame. I'm sure the people who saw your memorable characterization in the picture have been just as interested in this intimate story of Rockney the Man. Well, Jack, there'll never be another rock. You know, he's just as alive today as he ever was. And as long as kids play football, his memory will live forever. Good night, Jack. Good night, Pat. <laughs>